Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Birol Oster. I am the director of Peace Islands Massachusetts branch. We are a non-profit, non-governmental organization uh, recently founded with the main mission of uh, building peace locally and globally. To this end, we uh, organize activities such as luncheons, uh, seminars, conferences like this. Uh, you can go to our uh, website. I believe everybody got a folder. If not, you can uh, approach me and I'll be happy to provide more information. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to thank uh, organizers, uh, co-sponsors, Boston College, uh, the Boise Center, uh, the uh, Islamic Civilizations Program for hosting this uh, event. And also everybody who helped uh, this uh, success, and also our uh, speakers. But I, I, I forgot to mention also the Harvard Cocalis Program for uh, co-sponsoring the event. And uh, I would like to thank our speakers for accepting our uh, invitation and being here. Uh, one uh, small uh, note. Uh, if you register, you should have a, a sticker in your folder, a red colored sticker, and we'll be serving lunch right after this downstairs. And uh, the uh, registered uh, attendees will have priority, and hopefully we'll have lunch for everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's keynote speaker, Professor Scott Alexander. He is currently an associate professor of Islam at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, where he is also director of the school's Catholic Muslim Studies program. Professor Alexander is a regular consultant on Catholic Muslim relations for the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops and for other local and uh, overseas organizations. He sits on the editorial board of the Journal of Islamic Law and Culture is co-editor of a dictionary of Christian-Muslim relations and is the author of a number of articles on Islamic history and religion and Christian-Muslim relations published in scholarly journals, edited in edited collections and encyclopedias such as the Encyclopedia of the Modern Middle East and the Encyclopedia of the Quran. His most recent book project is entitled The Race to Goodness and end to triumphalism in Christian-Muslim relations. In March of 2007, Scott was one of the five U.S. scholars to be awarded an Association of Theological Schools Lilly Faculty Fellowship in support of his research and writing. Beyond his extensive work with the Muslim community in Chicago and the U.S., Scott also has first-hand experience with Muslim communities in the traditional Muslim world and is currently working to expand the outreach of Catholic Theological Union's Catholic Muslim Studies program to similar programs in Nigeria, the Middle East and the Southeast Asia. Please welcome Professor Alexander. Thank you very much, uh, Bureau, for your kind uh, introduction. Um, let me uh, first join my voice uh, with that of Bureau's in thanking uh, all the sponsors of today's uh, events. Uh, to save time, I, I won't mention them all. You know who you are, and you have my profound gratitude uh, for putting your energies and talents and treasure um, into uh, a gathering such as this. I also have a few things I just want to do before I before I begin, one is in the interest of truth in advertising. Uh, some of you who um, notice these things uh, probably already recognize by now that the title on my slide and the title on the program do not exactly match. Um, it says on the program, The Spectrum of Contemporary Islamic Renewal and Reform in Turkey. Uh, actually, the presentation is looking at uh, Hizmet or the Yudan movement or the volunteer movement, uh, whichever. Uh, nomenclature you prefer to use, um, set against the backdrop of the dynamic of renewal and reform in Islamic history, but with a particular focus on the contemporary scene globally. Okay, um, 
which leads me to my second point uh, by way of introduction, um, which is a, a disclaimer that's of some source of embarrassment to me. Uh, I am by no means an expert in Turkey, and um, uh, what we have among us, and we've heard this morning from some of the leading um, intellectuals in the study of contemporary Turkey, uh, Turkish politics, and the intersection between politics and religion from a variety of disciplinary angles, and I'm, I'm just so honored to be among them, um, but also ashamed because I'm a rank amateur and I get, you know, a whole keynote, you know, address. So um, I don't know where Boston College's commitment to justice is or, or where the Muslim organizations and Turkish organizations, but there is no justice here, And uh, uh, but sometimes um, uh, hospitality trumps justice and for that I must exp I express my, my gratefulness. Um, uh, it reminds me, though, my situation in talking about Turkey uh, to some of the folks in this audience reminds me of the story of, of, of William Smith, who's the survivor of the great Johnstown flood in the early part of the 20th century in Pennsylvania. It was one of the greatest floods, that, you know, given the early part of the 9th century, it had one of the greatest death tolls. Uh, you know, before you had, you know, large skyscrapers and, and, and buildings that would come down easily and earthquakes from a natural disaster, one of the largest death tolls. And, you know, he survived and he would constantly, from that point on, regale anybody with whom he came in contact with his stories of surviving the Johnstown Flood. And, um, yeah, and people, he was a lovely man and people tolerated this, you know, and uh, the stories got embellished more and more as time went on. And finally, Mr. Smith is on his deathbed and his family is gathered around and his pastor comes in, luckily before he actually passes to the great beyond. And, um, he looks at his pastor, and his pastor says, is there anything I can do for you, Bill? And he says, I'm ready, pastor. He says, okay. But pastor, do you have any advice for me? If I'm lucky enough to be blessed by God and enter paradise, do you have any advice for me? He said, well, Bill, I assume that, that if you get there, you're going to want to tell everybody there about your great story surviving the Johnstown flood. And, you know, he's kind of like, yeah, that's stating the obvious, of course, I can't wait to be able to do that. He said, okay, my one piece of advice is that you should remember one thing. Noah will be in the audience. <laughs> so, I've got a lot of Noahs here. I apologize in advance. Um, and, uh, uh, I guess the, 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 the warning is, you know, not to take too seriously anything I say. Um, uh, the presentation is structured basically five sections. I've got a brief preliminary axiom that I want to just set before you. Um, I, I want to talk about one of the categories, it's a problematic category, uh, most of you are familiar with the reasons why, but I'm going to go through it anyway, uh, in which uh, a, a movement like uh, his men is often placed moderate Islam, although uh, fewer and fewer uh, Turkish uh, Muslim movements are allowed to be in that category anymore for a variety of interesting political reasons. Um, then move on to a brief historical perspective on Tajdid uh, al-Islah, this dynamic of renewal and reform, which I'm claiming uh, is, met, is a you know, contemporary manifestation of, followed by um, uh, uh, my own very tentative um, and, and somewhat uh, and, and flawed, of course, uh, for full typology of a spectrum of contemporary renewal and reform uh, movements. It's just a heuristic device, not something that I'm at all proposing is the ultimate way of thinking about these things or, or categorizing these different movements. Uh, and then um, looking at uh, his met and where his met falls in this spectrum. And then finally, um, we're trying an attempt to relate it to the topic of our, of our conference today, uh, raising the question just briefly, Hizmet and uh, Turkish democracy question mark. Um, and I just have a few remarks I want to share with you uh, in that regard. So if that sounds like a plan, and even if it doesn't, um, we'll go forward because that's, uh, that's the, all I can do uh, today. Um, the preliminary axiom uh, that I'd like to put before you is, in part, as I'm suggesting here, stating the obvious. It comes from my training as a historian of religions. And, uh, you know, one of the axioms of that discipline 
uh, is that the singular terms we use to refer to some of the more well-known religious traditions of the world, sometimes they're called the world religions, all religions are world religions, they exist in the world, but, uh, you know, the singularity of them, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and of course Hinduism is a very problematic uh, <laughs> construction for, for precisely this reason, that singularity is very misleading. And why? Because it obscures the stunning internal diversity. Um, within, uh, you know, within those, those very broad categories. And it even encourages uh, the kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, essentialism uh, that we heard about uh, earlier today um, by uh, Dr. Euclidean. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's a problem. And we always have to remind ourselves that no religious tradition is a monolith. Um, and this goes for Islam as well as it goes for any tradition. Um, uh, Islam, like Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, is lived out in a variety of different cultural and historical expressions, many of which are accepted, but some of which are contested among different types of Muslims. I mean, you can take this to its radical extreme and say there are as many Islams as there are Muslims, you know, or as many Christianities as there are Christians. Um, and, 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 you know, in, in some respects, that, that's very true. Um, and so that insight is, is very important to take with us, with us excuse me, as we move forward. So moving to this category of moderate Islam, where, where, which is kind of a, you know, a, sometimes a movement like his met gets placed in that category. Um, I, I guess what I want to say is, even if the intent is, is good, uh, this is not a felicitous uh, category. Um, why? Well, like moderate Muslim, moderate Islam is actually an indirect prejudicial slur. Um, it reminds me of phrases like, the Good Samaritan. I mean, we, uh, Christians use that phrase all the time uh, to refer to the parable in which Jesus of Nazareth in the Gospel of Luke tells the story about this Samaritan who actually does this wonderful thing and, and takes care of a man we presume to be uh, a Jew. And the reason why this is such a shocking tale is because these two communities, the Samaritans and the, the, the Jews that are devoted to temple worship um, in Jerusalem, are at odds with each other, the Samaritans are really thought of the, as the arch heretics and, and vice versa, they're profoundly alienated. But this is coming from a Jewish perspective, Jesus is a Jew telling it to a Jewish audience, and although he doesn't use these, this terminology, um, you know, the Samaritan gets referred to as a good Samaritan, right? And the implication is that most of them are bad, right? Um, uh, the sober Catholic, or the sober Irish Catholic, to throw in ethnicity there. Uh, the intelligent evangelical. I mean, these all sound like compliments, but they're in, indirect expressions of deeply flawed assumptions about another's uh, religion. Uh, here we have a deeply flawed assumption that one insect is making of another, right? Uh, the, the praying mantis is saying to the bug on the leaf, it may look that way, but actually I'm an atheist. Um, that's a joke. It's, uh, it's, uh, if you need those cues, I'll be sure to give them to you as we move along. Um, at its core uh, is a negative essentialist value judgment, uh, which uh, of course means that the statement carries very little analytical weight. I mean, anything that, any categorization that has at its core a negative essentialist value judgment is not going to get you very far in understanding whatever you're trying to understand, particularly if it's a phenomenon about how human beings understand themselves and express themselves and organize themselves, etc. You know, it's the seen one, seen them all, and just to sort of, I guess, beat a dead horse, I'm sure you get this point by now. Um, you know, if I know relatively little about a group, I'm told that a group may be a threat to me, I assume, even if I have, you know, the best of intentions, that the bad apples, however few, represent the entire group. And so, you know, there we have uh, Faisal Shahzad. Um, and uh, this is uh, John Yagan. Um, who probably is, is better known to people in the Boston area, uh, particularly Catholics, than he may be elsewhere. Um, it, the reason I have his picture out here is because I think there really is a sense, and I use this a lot in interreligious context, particularly in the context of Catholic-Muslim mutual understanding, that speaking about moderate Muslims is something like speaking about non-pedophile priests. You know, I suppose it's supposed to be a, a compliment, but I think most more Catholic priests I know that are that are good men, you know, striving to live good lives, the vast majority of them, they'd rather just be known as priests and, and you identify the pedophiles as pedophiles. Um, so again, the underlying assumption is that most Muslims are extremists or most priests are pedophiles, and that's not helpful. 
Um, the facts are, as, as, as probably many of you are aware, um, and I take these from, the, the, it's, it's the only repository of these facts that we have, um, that uh, Dalia Mugahed's Gallup study, uh, which is the statistical equivalent of uh, a review of the opinions of 90% of the Muslim world, one can debate that, but Gallup has a pretty good method for doing this, um, only 7% of uh, Muslims worldwide feel that the 9-11 attacks, for example, were completely justified. Large numbers of local and global Muslim leaders have been vigorously and vociferously protesting the hijacking, ironic uh, term, of their own faith to advance political the violent agendas. A lot of Americans, U.S. Americans, are unaware of this. You know, you hear constantly the refrain, you know, uh, where are the moderate Muslims that's, that's used in this regard? Why don't the moderate Muslims speak up, you know? And it's like, you know, well, many Muslims are speaking up just because you don't hear them. It doesn't mean they're not, they're not saying things. Um, uh, so let's, let's move now, um, sort of, now that we sort of uh, taking care of that sort of popular category, you know, into which uh, a, a movement like his met is placed. Although, as I mentioned, uh, it seems increasingly uh, there are folks who, who, who used to, with good intentions, refer to his men as moderate Islam, but now um, looking at some of the perceived connections between the Gulen movement and the AK party in Turkey. Um, and uh, some disaffection or disillusion, which I'll, which I'll refer to towards the end of my presentation, um, with some of the um, uh, foreign policy decisions uh, made uh, by Prime Minister Erdogan's government, uh, uh, and knowing that he comes from a quote-unquote Islamist background, maybe these Muslims aren't as moderate as they used to be, and maybe these Hizmet people aren't as moderate as we thought they were. So, um, uh, leaving that unhelpful category of moderate Islam, what I'd like to do is, you know, explore the possibility of setting uh, his met uh, against the backdrop of the dynamic of renewal and reform, the Arabic terms again being tajdid and islah. And so, you know, in order to do that, just a brief historical perspective. Um, the scriptural locus classicus um, for the idea of tajdid um, uh, but both roots occur in the Quran, but not exactly those particular uh, noun forms. Um, is this um, uh, hadith al mujaddid? Um, indeed, uh, the Prophet uh, Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, uh, is recorded to have said, Indeed, God will send to this community at the beginning or end, the uh, ras of every hundred years, one who will renew, mujaddidu. Uh, renew for it, in other words, renew for the community, its religion. So uh, it's the idea of a centennial renewal. Uh, it doesn't just have to be one, but maybe at least one every year, one will come. Um, by the way, I, you know, we'll, we'll see later, I won't make explicit reference to this, but certainly Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini um, falls into this category uh, for many Shiites, and. Um, uh, it, it, it's ironic uh, that um, you know if if, if U.S. Uh, uh, sort of foreign policy makers and foreign affairs people were looking more at religion and looking more at these kinds of categories and ideas, they would recognize that 1979 was actually the turn of the Muslim century from the 14th to the 15th century. So you know, it's, it's, I don't think it's too much of a coincidence to think that the energy behind the Iranian Revolution which brought about the Islamic Republic um, as a result of the charismatic magnetism of a figure like Khomeini had, had, had nothing to do with this uh, uh, mujaddid ideal or that it just coincidentally came at the turn of the Muslim century. Uh, to go way back in history, one of the earliest recognized and uh, rare political figures, you can see uh, Khomeini fits more into the typology or the expectations of mujaddid Typically, these people were religious scholars, you know, or, or came from among the religious elite, or if they didn't come from an elite family, they sort of established their 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 religious hasa, their piety, and began, you know, began, you came to be came to be recognized as someone who embodied the ideals of the faith. Um, but um, you did have some exceptions, and uh, this early Umayyad caliph Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. Uh, you know, we sometimes, sometimes call the Omar the pious, um, Saleh or something, was, you know, uh, uh, referred to in some of the early sources as a mujaddid. 
you know, kind of trying to reverse, and this is a massive perspective, but trying to reverse the, the, the worldly uh, kingship dynamic um, that the Umayyad uh, dynasty gets, um, uh, gets associated with uh, to try to, you know, more truly uh, actualize the, the deeper structures of what it means to be a Khalifa of Rasulullah, what it means to be a, a successor of the Messenger of God. Um, if we look at um, uh, this, this dynamic that I've been referring to, that has its lowest classifus in this particular hadith, um, you see that I think it's fair to describe it uh, as a dynamic of adaptive continuity and change that you find present throughout the history of Muslim societies across a variety of the stunning array of cultures that has made up these societies uh, for over 1400 years. For most of Islamic history, uh, the dynamic was indigenously stimulated, I would say. So in other words, what I mean by indigenously is, uh, as problematic as the term civilization is, if you, if you, if you say within Islamic civilization broadly construed, the stimuli for, that, that would trigger um, uh, renewal and reform thinking or movements, and they're not always one and the same thing, was oftentimes something that was happening within Islamic society, um, uh, you know, generated from, from tensions that were emerging as that society was evolving internally, uh, and while every society it, or, 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 or cultural context is related to what lies kind of outside, because there's obviously no firm boundaries, um, you know, I think the, the a case can be made uh, for this. If you look at the Abbasid revolution, for instance, in the 8th century, the Sunni revival, the so-called Sunni revival of the 11th century after the Buyid uh, uh, period, um, which was a Shiite dynasty that had kind of kept the Abbasid caliph under its tutelage, um, the movement of Ahmad Sirhindi in the subcontinent, and uh, of course the movement of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in uh, 18th century Arabia, these were not largely responses to uh, uh, external stimuli or uh, exogenous stimuli. Even Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was responding more to what, you know, to what could be categorized from, categorized from an Arab peninsula perspective, Ottoman imperialism. It was a kind of, it was part of a, an Arab nativist, um, you know, reaction uh, to what was perceived as Ottoman imperialism. So, um, you know, these things weren't really, and, and even though you had real dynamics well underway, uh, in the time of Sir Hindi and, and Abdul Wahab, they don't seem to have been reacting primarily to that. More recently, however, um, the beginning, you know, in the, in the 18th and 19th century and moving forward, um, this dynamic has been stimulated by the relatively exogenous forces of Western colonialism, imperialism, and secular modernity. I mean, these things in many ways go together. Um, uh, in the experience of a great swath of the Muslim world for uh, a few centuries, um, um, leading uh, and, and continuing on in some ways into our own. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the spectrum of contemporary uh, renewal and reform. Um, what might this spectrum look like? Well, first of all, I, I have to confess I'm a little uncomfortable with spectrum because Spectrum is actually too linear. You actually need it, and this is where I'm ashamed to say I, I, I let the limits of my of my PowerPoint and, and my you know kind of being taken up with the, the fact that I've got a new computer which can run uh, some of the software a little better, and so I just got a little too much into this. Um, but I couldn't find something that would you know that would let me graphically display you know a bunch of overlapping circles that were sort of not any kind of neat arrangement you know um, and that intersected with one another and almost need a 3d diagram to do this is there's no way almost to do this uh, in a in a way that sort of conveys the complexity of the relationship between these categories and the porousness of their boundaries uh, in any two-dimensional uh, format but be that as it may we'll, we'll go ahead with the with a spectrum here, so um, so you see, and I, there's no attempt to left, right here necessarily. I just put these in this this order. I, I, I'm, I'm identifying four types, and again, this is this is tentative, heuristic. I, in no way these are you know ideal types, um, but in the sense that I think Weber you know intended the ideal type to be thought of, not as something uh, that is by any means uh, unchallengeable. Um, Neo-modernist, uh, 
renewal and reform, neo-traditionalist, renewal and reform, Puritan, and some part of that, I mean, take that word, you know, in, in, in a way from Marshall Hudson, and then more lately from uh, Khaled Abu Fadl, um, who you'll see belongs in the neo-modernist category from, from, from my perspective, but uh, for more familiar terms, Wahhabi Salafi. In other words, I mean, Salaf, Salafi means a number of different things, obviously. And, uh, you know, there, there, there are, have been developments in Salafism over the 20th century uh, that make using Salafi as a monolithic term as problematic as, 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 as use, using any category in that way, in a centralist way. So I'm talking about that Salafism that is closely associated with the Wahhabism, um, uh, not some of the other types that uh, have not been as popular um, over the last 60 or 70 years. Uh, and finally, what I'm calling, and that's largely a Sunni phenomenon, obviously, and then finally, the a Shiite, uh, 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 a special Shiite version of, of renewal and reform, um, you know, which is this revolutionary type um, that we have uh, in Iran. One could pick various icons of these movements to choose. I, I put uh, Amina Wadud, uh, she's an African-American um, Muslim thinker uh, here in the United States. Um, uh, Muhammad Tahir al-Qadri, who's the inspiration behind Minhaj al-Qur'an. It's a South Asian, Pakistani-centered uh, movement. Um, uh, this is Yusuf al-Qaradawi. Um, and uh, the, the third fellow under, uh, above the Shiite, the Shiite little, uh, part of the spectrum is Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, the current um, the supreme leader in Iran. Um, and again, you know, and I've already made reference to this, but you know, just one of many workable typologies. And the boundaries between the categories are fluid, porous, and in certain instances even multiply overlapping. And that I have no way of. Uh, you know, kind of demonstrating that visually. Um, I have the way, some of you might not, so I'd like to know how to do that, but I have no way of doing it. So let me talk a little bit about, you know, how I define these, these, these uh, heuristic tentative categories. Um, first, the neo-modernist. Um, uh, well, inspired by classical Muslim scholarship, um, uh, also inspired by late 19th and early 20th century Muslim modernism. By that, that's why I call it neo-modernist, because in a sense I see uh, the people that belong to this category as sort of taking up after some interruption um, uh, the project of people like uh, Muhammad Abdu and Mahmoud Shabtut. I mean, that, that's, and, and these are people that worked uh, in the early part of the, of the, the 20th century, um, uh, both of them being e Egyptian, but they're folks in other parts of the world, obviously. Um, it, so classical Muslim scholarship, uh, not just Sunni, but, but across the spectrum, um, late 19th, early 20th century modernism, and postmodern and postcolonial philosophy and hermeneutics. I mean, so I think it's an important defining characteristic of this category, for me at least. Um, no identifiable associated grassroots or social movement, largely because uh, one of the hallmarks of this, uh, uh, this, this trend, if you will, this category, is that you, know, it's, 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 you, you find it in the, in the thinking and writing of fairly elite types um, who are doing fairly deep and sophisticated thinking about um, you know, the, the, the revitalization, renewal, uh, and reform of, of, of Muslim institutions and societies. Um, in these writings, you find some themes that, that are very prevalent, like commitment to strong civic, uh, non-governmental institutions, um, commitment to progressive ideas of religious liberty and pluralism, and progressive democratic ideals, as well as select like, secular institutions. So, what I mean by this is, in the writings of the folks I would categorize as neo-modernists. They have good things to say about the secular, the, you know, and there are some secular institutions that they uh, they respect uh, very well. These would obviously not be aggressively or actively secular, but more passively secular, um, to use um, uh, the, that useful typology. Um, uh, again, I'm just throwing some names out here. Um, uh, Farid Isak, the, the South African. Muslim liberation theologian would fall into this category. I think Tariq Ramadan, 
especially since the publication of his book, Radical Reform, where he does actually do some very serious uh, and deeply engaged uh, thinking about uh, Islamic jurisprudence, uh, the reform of Islamic jurisprudence, but then puts it in a broader, in a broader framework where he actually talks a lot about uh, the importance of non-governmental organizations. Um, uh, Amina Wadud, uh, who uh, made her initial mark uh, in Quranic feminist hermeneutics um, in her book The Quran and the Woman, and um, uh, has a second book, I think, uh, of great import called Inside the Gender Jihad, which maybe some of you have, have read. Khalid Abu Fadl uh, was a classically tra trained uh, faqih, classically tra trained uh, Muslim jurist, and uh, you know, a renewal and reformist thinker, I think, of the first order. He teaches at, uh, in the law school at UCLA um, and is the author of a number of different, uh, different books. I think one of his best in this regard, one of his most thoughtful and extensive, is um, um, Speaking in the Name of God or Speaking in God's Name. And the subtitle is um, uh, Women. Um, do you know the subtitle? No, I'm yeah, sorry. Speaking in God's Name and the subtitle has to do with uh, women in Islam. Uh, and to a certain extent, uh, the late Sohush, Abdul Karim Sohush, and this is interesting because in some ways he was an ideologue of the uh, Iranian Revolution, so why isn't he in that category? Well, that bespeaks this porousness that I'm talking about, um, and the fact that these are not hard and fast categories, and some people move between them, um, but also because he's been saying things of late that are a little different than some of the things he's, he said um, earlier on in his academic career. You, you could throw others in here, like Muhammad Arkun, or the, you know, others who would, would, would be in this category. Uh, maybe even Rashid Dabushi. I don't know. In all of this, by the way, I couldn't figure out. I, I, I'd like to share with you this, this ignorance because it's like, it's challenging, and, and, you know, and, and, I, and I hope it makes um, this kind of typology more valuable and more dynamic rather than less. I couldn't figure out where to put Tunisia, Nahda, Rashid Ganoushi, I just for, for a variety of different reasons. In a way, revolutionary, because that's you know how Nahda is finally was finally able to come to power in a kind of quiet revolution, part of the Arab Spring. But, but Sunni, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, conservative in, in in some ways, conservative uh, Salafi roots in some ways, but also open to uh, different. Uh, uh, elements that you would find in neo-traditional. So, um, just this shows you just how um, flexible one has to be when creating uh, technologies like this. Um, uh, rep, I would say, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So let me talk about neo-traditionalists. Um, I would say that the. the these are movements uh, led by individuals who are inspired by classical Sunni scholarship and traditional, traditional Sufi piety and spirituality. For me, this is a hallmark of this neo-traditionalism, um, I don't mean traditionalism in the negative sense, but, but an attempt to revive uh, in an adapted and dynamic way a uh, tradition um, that in some ways, interestingly enough, has been subverted by the Puritan project. Because part of the Puritan renewal and reform, you know, part of Ahmad ibn Abdul Wahab's vision was we're going to skip over about 1,300 years of Muslim history uh, and institutions to get back to the real thing, you know, in Medina. So in a way, uh, neo-traditionalism is responding to that. Um, so Sufi piety and spirituality come, in, come in, uh, in a big way there because that's precisely what comes under attack by the, by the Puritan uh, perspective. Um, uh, it animates, this neo-traditionalism animates regionally centered to global grassroots movements. Um, there is in the two cases that I'm thinking of primarily as I construct this category, pivotal charismatic figure at the center of it. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, in these two notable instances, these charismatic figures are living in the West. And I think that's, for a variety of reasons, I think it's primarily due to the power and scope of their influence, because they're so, they've been so influential, and these movements um, so potentially, even though they're peaceful movements, so potentially destabilizing of the status quo, 
that for a variety of reasons, both these charismatic leaders have to put themselves in self-imposed exile, one in Canada and one in the United States. Um, commitment to strong civic institutions, uh, commitment to religious liberty pluralism, um, uh, not perhaps exactly as expansive as in the in neo-modernist uh, 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 case, and socially conservative democracy, structured and regulated by traditional Islamic values and morality. Kind of like a democracy that reminds you more of you know, the kind of vision for U.S. American democracy that would be espoused by folks more on the conservative end of the, of the U.S. American spectrum rather than the, 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 the far left. Um, and uh, again, you, so you already saw these folks. Um, Khavri's picture was on the spectrum. Uh, as I said, he is at the center of a very important movement uh, called Minhaj al-Qur'an. Um, and then um, he's met uh, with Khatib uh, uh, Bidan at the, at the center of that movement as the charismatic pivotal figure. All right, so moving on to this uh, third category, Puritan, Wahhabi Salafi. Um, inspired by the Sunni Hanbali reformationalism of Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, but a very select reading of Ibn Taymiyyah, um, so select that there's no recognition that Ibn Taymiyyah was a Sufi, but he was. And so, so all of the very vituperative anti-Sufi rhetoric of, of, of this particular um, trend in, in, in ritual and reform um, departs uh, from the context of Ibn Taymiyyah in a significant way. Uh, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, of course, looming large um, and lending his name in a way to the movement, although many people within uh, this category would reject Wahhabi as an, as an appellation because it kind of goes against the very principles of the movement. It's kind of shirkish in a way because they're talking about a human being and they prefer to just call themselves uh, the Ahad Ahl Salaf. Um, characterized by a strict scripturalist critique of innovation, the right? yes. Um, especially in the form of Sufi piety uh, practice and progressive approaches to religious liberty and pluralism. Um, this is somewhat similar to you know, the reaction of um, North American uh, Christian fundamentalism. I use that term, I will only use that term with a capital F because in that case it's a self-descriptor. Christians call themselves returning to the fundamentals and they were doing this return because they were trying to respond to what they felt was the over the threat of an overweening Enlightenment rationalism that was going to do things like authority the Bible by teaching Darwinian evolution in the schools. And so many of you know about uh, you know, Spokes Monkey Trial and that, uh, that dynamic. Um, uh, so religious liberty uh, becomes a problem. Um, uh, I remember going to a church in Indianapolis, a fundamentalist church, um, it really self-described self -described as linked to this tradition of Christian fundamentalism of the late 19th century. And there were two young girls, sisters, who were singing little songs. Um, and uh, they sang a little ditty on the ecumenical movement, um, which they saw as very bad, actually. So the term ecumenical is bad because it's relativist. It's going to take, draw people away from the true faith. And I'll never forget one lyric. I think it's been immortalized, actually, in a, in, in, in a video. Um, it goes up like Catholic, Protestant, and Jew, Buddhist, Hin, Muslim, and Hindu. I guess they'll want the devil too in the ecumenical movement. <laughs> so that doesn't say it all. I don't know what to thank you. So um, you got so, so something similar um, you know, going on here with the perceived threat from this kind of uh, pluralism and liberalism. Um, uh, and, and in the case of, 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 of the Puritan model, um, you know, this is, even though the Wahhabi movement was not a direct response to uh, Western colonialism and imperialism, certainly this, this movement as it grows uh, and moving forward in history does become precisely that. And so one can understand, um, you know, how uh, these elements of Western secularity, including, uh, you know, uh, tenets of religious liberty and pluralism, can be seen as as, as a threatening part of the colonial uh, and imperialist project. Um, established, it's an established global phenomenon, nearly sectarian, I would say, um, in some ways. 
um, with numerous elite and grassroots institutions and a commitment to a vision of a new Medinan religious utopia, either through a pan-Islamic reinstitution of the caliphate, Allah has tahrir, or through a global socialist salafization of nation states. I don't know what you want to put in that category. In some ways, the dynamics of, 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 of uh, the role of Jamaat Islami in, in Pakistan fits into this category, although I don't know whether we can oversimplify and say that Pakistan itself you know, can be put into that specific category. Um, again, I would, I would, you know, adduce uh, some representatives of this uh, movement would be, uh, you know, the, the, the movement of al ikhwan al muslimun uh, you know, inspired by the writings and teachings of both Hassan al-Banna and, and Sayyid Qutb, and also jamaat al islami and uh, Abu Ala al-Mududi. And then finally, the Shiite uh, revolutionary uh, category here. Um, uh, inspired by what I would characterize as a novel interpretation and synthesis of traditional Shiite jurisprudence and tropes of resistance against corrupt rule and oppression with contemporary political ideologies of anti-imperialist resistance and liberation. So, in other words, this is the synthesis. You've got traditional Shiite jurisprudence, particularly the role of the Mujtahid. Some of you that know that one of the differences between Ithna uh, Ashari, the twelve or Shiite legal theory, and um, uh, Sunni legal theory is the conception of the role of Ishtihad, um, which is actually uh, almost replaces in, in, in Shiite jurisprudential theory Ijma, because everyone who is capable of exercising Ijtihad, everyone who has, every jurist, uh, who has the, the training to exercise the ishtihad is under an obligation to do so. So that uh, deferent, def deference to establish legal rulings and authority, taklid, is something that actually is not appropriate for the munshtayim. So uh, you've got this built-in freedom to really renew and reform uh, using the tools and, and substance of, of traditional fiqh. And then you've got these tropes of resistance against corruption, corrupt rule and oppression, which have been part of, of, of Shiite identity for centuries and centuries. Um, and then you mix those with contemporary political ideologies of anti-imperialist resistance and, and liberation. And you've got some of these characters, characteristics of this uh, category, I think. Um, and I, you know, again, um, you get these you know, two important Shiite uh, um, movements, realities that are closely related. The Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, and uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, and many others, and Lebanon's Hezbollah, um, with someone like Hassan Nasrallah, kind of as the you know the, the guide and head. And interestingly enough, I mean here too we have a very important uh, reflection of the the ethnic diversity, the important. Uh, Largely bipartite, it's more than that, obviously, but you know, so you have an Iranian and, and an Arab, uh, you know, right here, uh, representing how this works in an Iranian sphere and how it works in an, in an Arab sphere. Um, it would be interesting to say, well, you know, uh, where does Ayatollah Sistani fit here? He probably doesn't fit into this uh, mold exactly where he fits, you know, I don't know. So it's one of those other individuals, you know, uh, like Banushi and Nahda, you know, where is the contemporary Iraq going? That certainly there are elements of Tajdeed and Islam at work, you know, but I don't think until, you know, these societies can begin to really get on their own uh, two feet, you know, and, and finally get up from under the, the, the shadow of being dominated by external forces, it's going to be difficult to say um, where we can place them. Some of you may be wondering, you know, what I would do with someone like Osama bin Laden. Uh, this is maybe betrays uh, some bias on my part, um, but I don't, there's nothing, in what I know about Bin Laden's writings and stuff, there's no constructivist vision there, it's, it's only resistance and, and deconstruction and destruction, actually. So I really don't see any elements of uh, Tajdeed and Islam. It's more, I and mean, if you want to get really uh, sharply critical, you could say it's more nihilism in, in a way uh, than anything else. So that's why I don't uh, feel like I have to even figure out a category to place uh, um, those kinds of folks uh, in. Um, so uh, fifth, as we move uh, into the last two sections, um, and I'll try to respect my time here and, and go as quickly as possible. Um, uh, his man, a neo-traditionalist, spiritual renewal and social reform movements. So I'm, I'm, I'm fleshing it out a little bit. Um, I'm 
I see the renewal dynamic happening a lot in terms of spirituality, uh, and then this spiritual, this, this commitment to an individual spirituality is connected to obviously working in society um, for for social reform, um, and that you know cuts a number of ways, and, and it, it, you know it makes people both strongly attracted to this movement and 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 lukewarm, and, and then strongly repelled by it. Um, let me skip over this slide because we don't have time. This is just the background of the Noor movement in Saint Mercy. Um, the the principal teachings of uh, Fatula Gulen um, that I would like to just lift up for our purposes of of expanding uh, my understanding of how his men fits into that category of neo traditionalist. Um, it's inspired by uh, uh, Saint Mercy uh, in the Norwegian movement. Um, and, and what I was saying in that previous slide is Norsi was really all about trying to um, bridge connections between the, 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 what, what he saw to be the valuable things of the Ottoman legacy and this move of, of, the, of, of the people of Anatolia, I should say, into modernity um, with the creation of this new Western nation state. Uh, and he was very concerned, uh, he was offered a position in the Eastern Dianet and he was very concerned, he refused it because I think he, he knew that this project of, uh, of aggressive secularism, uh, laïcité, this kind of Turkish version of laïcité, was hostile to Islam and, and he felt that really Islam was, the, was going to be the key uh, to uh, people being able to move into modernity and adjust and adapt at the same time, be able to retain their identity, um, and, and and particularly, uh, you know, Nursi was someone who was convinced that 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 uh, uh, that the loss of spirituality, the loss of a sense of the spiritual, uh, would be one of the great downsides uh, to any uh, secularization uh, project, be it be it more benign or be it more malevolent. Sorry. Um, uh, so, Gulen advocates a socio-spiritual approach uh, to renewal and reform, linking traditional personal, spiritual, and moral character and duty, this notion of ibadah, with family values and consequent uh, social reform. Um, he emphasizes service, is met, it's one of the names of the movement, in the form of education, social justice, and intercultural and interreligious dialogue. And this is uh, what I'm trying to reflect here is the language of the movement itself. I'm not trying to make a judgment um, one way or the other. Um, uh, an important, I, I think, especially for someone like myself who's involved in interreligious dialogue, uh, and we already heard about how a dialogue in Europe um, is an important um, uh, phenomenon in the whole process of, of European Muslims being able to forge for themselves uh, a, a new brand of European Islam for their communities as new immigrant communities as opposed to the indigenous European Muslim communities that have been in existence for so long. Uh, this principle uh, that's at the heart of Yulen's commitment to dialogue, Hosh Gulu, it's often translated as tolerance. I think that's an unfortunate translation because it doesn't really mean seeing the goodness in others. Um, practice Hosh Gulu so that your bosom becomes wide like the ocean. Become inspired with faith and love of human beings. Let there be no troubled souls to whom you do not offer a hand and remain, uh, and about whom you remain unconcerned. Um, this is not an expression of relativism. Um, this is an expression of um, the, the recognition, I, I read it, of the dignity of every human person that's very deeply rooted in a commitment to absolute truth. And I know there are lots of folks uh, who might be more secularly inclined who would see those things as irreconcilable. You can't really believe in the in the fundamental dignity of every human person and also think uh, that there's something like absolute truth. Um, I, I, won't, I, don't, I can't necessarily easily accept that as axiomatic. I think it's an important challenge to the idea that you can hold those things together. I think they can be held together in creative tension and, and many of us who are in interreligious dialogue and many, many Catholics you know, are faced with the same challenge to hold those things in creative tension. Um, 
Uh, democracy, um, and this is uh, one of many statements that Gulen has made about democracy, and it's not, as some of you were saying earlier, a developed philosophy, Islamic philosophy of democracy that's, in, that's using and engaging you know, sophisticated uh, disciplinary methodologies. He's really speaking as a traditional Muslim scholar, coming very much out of a traditional heritage, um, but, but, but attempting very sincerely, I think, to engage uh, some of the challenges and promises of modernity. So he says democracy has developed over time, just as it has gone through many different stages in the past. It will continue to evolve and improve in the future. Along the way, it will be shaped into a more humane and just system, one based on righteousness and reality. And I think this reflects, I mean, also as a Catholic, I can say this reflects a certain healthy religious critique about terms that, that those of us, and I can prove myself in this category, who are great fans of the, of the best of secularity can sometimes lose sight of, and that is, you know, uh, things like democracy are not perfect, and, um, you know, what we're referring to in reality when we use such a wonderful term uh, may not match up to the, to the theory. Um, if human beings are considered whole without disregarding the spiritual dimension of their existence and their spiritual needs, and without forgetting that human life is not limited to this mortal life, and that all people have a great craving for eternity, democracy could reach the peak of perfection and bring even more happiness to humanity. And then the punchline, Islamic principles of equality, tolerance, and justice can help it do just this. I believe he believes that. And there are some people who would look at this cynically and say, no, but the, those Islamic principles aren't really true principles of equality and tolerance, and so all they'll do is corrupt democracy and turn it into something else. Um, again, I'm not sure that we, we have to be reasonably cynical as we analyze these things, but um, uh, ultimately I come at this, as someone teaches in a school of theology and is engaged in religious dialogue, I come at this uh, from a somewhat theological perspective and hope is a very important virtue uh, for me, um, even when I, when I do my analysis. Um, so finally, the question of his method in Turkish democracy. Um, you know, is his method going to uh, feed into what some might describe as neo-Ottoman democracy? I mean, this is this idea of Yeni Osmanlıca is a very sorry Osmanlıca is a very controversial uh, term, uh, highly contested. Um, it's 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 been used to describe the foreign policy of the AK party in a negative way. You know, I mean, the AK party is about re-establishing Turkish dominance. Um, you know, in some ways it's, it, it seems true. We've heard reference this morning to the to the Turkification of Central Asia. You know, what's 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 actually going on there? Um, you know, what role does does Hizmet uh, play in that? These are all questions that need to be addressed by by people both within the movement and outside the movement who are concerned with 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 exploring these issues. Um, the term has been rejected by, you know, some of these folks in the AK party, Dovatolo and, and others. Um, um, it's sometimes contrasted with Ottoman revivalism um, by those who wish to give it a positive valence um, and suggest that things like, you know, Ottoman revivalism is the attempt to sort of revive the Ottoman Empire, maybe in some disguised form, uh, but Ottoman, uh, neo-Ottomanism is maybe an attempt to take some of the best elements of Ottoman civilization and to begin to use them as resources for, you know, uh, the reinvention of contemporary uh, Turkish society. Again, um, uh, a vague kind of uh, idea, but, but both positive and negative um, valences of the term. These are natural questions about the future of Turkish democracy. I mean, they're similar in some ways to questions about the future of Russian democracy or the future of any democracy, including the the democracy in the United States, which in some cases uh, in, in jeopardy, I think. Um, uh, the question that people raise is there is, is this Islam in general and his method in particular exercise an undue influence on this process? That's the question I want to sort of leave you with with a final anecdote. Well, for decades now, the Turkish press has been increasingly filled with books and articles raising concerns about what the role uh, his net plays or will play in the future of Turkish democracy. They're legitimate concerns. Um, equally robust the media efforts of his net and its supporters uh, to uh, say what their vision is um, and, and that it's not uh, what, it's, what the detractors make it out to be. I think the discussion and debates are rooted in a shared and accurate perception uh, in Turkey, 
that religious convictions and values have played a major role in bringing about democratic reforms. I don't, I don't, I don't know anyone who, who you know, some, even, you know, even people that might say, well, you call this democracy more democracy. Many of those of us who, you know, are looking at the Turkish situation are saying, well, it looks like, you know, at, at least if you freeze frame this, um, uh, Turkish democracy is one, of the, it is one of the best situations it's ever been in. Um, you know, since the founding of the Republic, if you can even talk about it going back that far. Um, and uh, I think it's difficult to deny, although I know this can be contested, that religion has played a major role in that. So the question is, you know, if religion has played that major role, um, you know, can we reasonably think of getting it out? Should we reasonably think of getting it out? Um, you know, especially in a social context where a strictly secular framework uh, won't work because the model of secularism was aggressive secularism, active secularism, not passive. So in all of this, uh, his method, Mr. Gulen, uh, in particular, have been attacked from many conflicting perspectives. As in, you see the images here, one is of, uh, uh, you know, that, that Fadjula Gulen exists within the mind of Tayyip Erdogan. So he's, he's driving uh, Tayyip Erdogan. And the other is that he's the Muslim Pope. Uh, you know, I mean, th th this can have a number of ways, you know, kind of maybe has the same kind of authority for people of his method as the Pope does, but I, for, for Catholics. But I think what this is, if you look at the websites that you can find this image on, it's more that he's a traitor of, of, of true Turkish nationalism. You know, so, um, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult to, you know, to, to, to understand. But, but, but because he's, 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 you know, kind of making overtures, you know, to the West and, and uh, the, it is the agent of the CIA and the Catholic Church, and he's a secret cardinal and all these kinds of things. So, um, I finally want to close with, with, with a, 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 a revealing anecdote about uh, perceptions of the question of religion and democracy in Turkey, uh, particularly his met uh, in this regard, um, and then a quote from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, which is probably an unexpected way for me to conclude. Um, uh, a member of the Senate Armed Services Committee was recently asked uh, a question about how people in the Senate uh, regard AK party rule. This is something I, this is not in the press, something I know of from you know, personal connections. And uh, this individual said, as this individual said to me, uh, most on Capitol Hill are very encouraged by the democratic reforms, but most are very concerned about the rise of Islamic fundamentalism in Turkey. That's the language. De facto rise of Islamic fundamentalism. Um, so for me, this response reflects both a failure to consider the significant historical differences between US, the US and the Turkish experience of secularism, what I was referring to before. Um, can you actually have a strictly secular framework for democracy in Turkey? We don't even have that here in the United States. You know, maybe in France to a certain degree, you know, but, it's, you know, but, but, but in the United States we don't. Why are you expecting that um, in, in Turkey? And also, amnesia, uh, when it comes to religion and democracy in the history of US foreign policy. And that's what I want to close with. Um, uh, in a really interesting book um, that's just come out, actually, written by Andrew Preston, called Sword of the Spirit, Shield of Faith, Religion in American War and Diplomacy. Uh, he looks in one of his later chapters at Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the arguments Roosevelt made. I, actually, he was on NPO, Terry Gross, he was on Fresh Air, very recently talking about this. The arguments that FDR made uh, to convince a previously isolationist U.S. Uh, electorate that it was worth getting involved in the Second World War. It was worth fighting Nazi Germany. And this is what he says. Storms from abroad directly challenge three institutions indispensable to Americans. The first is religion. He, so he sees Nazism as a challenge first to religion. It is the source of the other two. Democracy and international good faith. Religion, and pardon the gender exclusive language, this is his language. Religion, by teaching man his relationship to God, gives the individual a sense of his own dignity and teaches him to respect himself by respecting his neighbors. Democracy, the practice of self-government, is a covenant among free men to accept the rights, respect the rights and liberties of their fellows. International good faith, as sister of democracy, springs from the will of civilized nations of men to respect the rights and liberties of other nations of men. In modern civilization, all three, religion, democracy, and international good faith, complement and support each other. 
I close with the question I asked myself is, have people in the U.S. Senate and Capitol Hill read their FDR lately? Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful speech. Uh, we'll be serving lunch downstairs. Ten yeah, minutes, call. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, sorry. For those who, for those who want to hungry. So, we might have questions? Sure. <laughs> Professor Lawrence. Um, how, how would um, the the non-leader of this movement, or you know, this, I think, as I understand, self-deprecative leader of this movement, um, feel being placed in the company of these, uh, you know, centenary uh, renewalist reformers. Is there not some contradiction in terms between the pedestal uh, that he's placed on uh, and his own sort of personal goals of? Modesty. Yeah, Absol there's absolutely a contradiction. In my case, though, it's, 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 it's the tension between emic and edict language. I mean, I'm just, you know, uh, for, for Fatal Gvan, I mean, to be put in any other, and I mean this seriously, to be put in any other existential category but heech, nothing, <laughs> you know, would be too much to swallow. I mean, this is a man who, who loathes the terminology Gvan movement. Uh, you know, um, and that's part of what makes him such a charismatic uh, figure for folks because he really seems to walk the walk, not just talk the talk, when it comes to the values of humility and modesty that are so central to uh, Islam in general and Sufi piety in particular. Um, but I'm not sure that should pre preclude me uh, from kind of analytically constructing categories and putting him in categories that he might not actually see himself. I think largely because the language I'm using is not his language. I mean, this is not this is not a world that he. I, I don't think he would sort of you know characterize people in quite these ways. If he were to make a typology of contemporary you know Islamic mm -hmm. movements, I wonder what that would look like. That would be very very interesting. And I wonder where he would place himself. He, you know, even in his very genuine idiom of modesty. I don't know if that answers you. I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, he, I don't think he'd like it. Being called a mujaddid, I don't think he'd like that at all. Yeah, and, uh, so, uh, throughout your presentation, uh, you mentioned reform and revival. Renewal, not revival. That's sorry, something yeah, different. Uh, renewal yeah. together. So, uh, so, do you see them like complementary or? I think so. I mean, I think they, they often come together in a pair in, in the literature, and so um, I, I think there is this, that, that renewal, and I mean, there are two terms that sometimes talk about the same thing. Um, you know, renewal, you know, kind of, kind of quite obviously, um, uh, you know, uh, renewing, you know, commitments, renewing faith, um, but at the same time, that process of renewal usually involves some kind of reform, both within the realm of one's, one's own experience, one's own ethics, but also in society. So you can, and you, so you can use either terms to talk about the individual or about society. Um, you see what I did, you know, when we moved to his bed, I, I, I talked about renewal in the spiritual sense, personal spiritual and familial spiritual sense, and then reform in the social sense, you know, only because I think, you know, in English at least, those terms uh, seem to match up a, a little better that way, but you can talk about the reform of the individual and the renewal of society as well. I think they're interchangeable. Yeah. When we look at the fourth category, one is Shia, who yes. aside, is modernist, but they don't have many mass followers, mass movements. Right. If you put it aside too, then in terms of mass movements, we have two competing Sunni traditions. Can you say that the tradition is for Sunni? Sure. They'd be, they'd be naturally, demographically, two competing Sunni uh, uh, models because they're only about 15 to 18 percent Shiites in the world. So. Make that make sense, yeah. Uh, my question is about, uh, when you have, I think, fabulously underlined the role of public religion in terms of uh, democratization. The big question mark that often comes along with that is, a point as you already raised, is about the, the question of pluralism. How do religious traditions are able to reconfirm their commitment to their traditions while accepting, you know, um, 
you know, differences in terms of uh, daily life or beliefs or no beliefs at all. Um, and basically, do you have any examples from other religious traditions? I do. I'm glad you asked that question because the Catholic Church had to be dragged kicking and screaming into this. If you, re if you look at the Syllabus of Errors, which was promulgated in the late 19th century, that was, one, and, and, uh, that was one of a number of um, magisterial documents, encyclicals, uh, that were issued to fight the modernist heresy. The modernist heresy. Now, would you like to know what some of the items of the modernist heresy were? Religious liberty. That was, so you have an official Catholic document in the late 19th century, and by the way, just as Catholics were trying to integrate, places like BC were being built, trying to integrate into US American society and say, you know, we as Catholics, we believe in liberty and religion free and freedom and democracy, and you've got the Vatican condemning religious liberty because it's basically saying this is a silly idea. When you know it's a true religion, then the state has an obligation to at least encourage people. We're not talking about, you know, inquisitions, you know, uh, a la, you know, uh, you know, uh, reconquista, post-reconquista Spain, but we are talking about, you know, the state doing its job and helping people get saved. The reality is the Catholic Church from the middle of the 19th century on was increasingly losing any kind of temporal power it had. You know, you had papal states in the latter part of the 19th century Italy. Uh, and it doesn't take too long to get to a point where suddenly you're getting uh, documents like Dignitatis Humanis, which was an encyclical of uh, John Paul II, which is an entire encyclical dedicated to religious liberty. And how religious liberty is one of the fundamental tenets and values of, of, of the Catholic Church. So in that case, um, you know, uh, an institution that had a lot of power and that was resisting some of these uh, liberal modern ideas, um, you know, in some ways, you know, was pressured by political and social developments to reevaluate, and it underwent its own kind of uh, reform and renewal process in the form of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, so, no, it's going to it's going to work differently, you know, for different religious traditions. But I think that in some ways it would be interesting to think about what this all means comparatively if you think about Turkey and the creation of a. Of a, of, a, of, a, of a staunchly secular nation state, you know, out of the, you know, the deconstructed Ottoman Empire, you know, in Anatolia, and, and, and you know, uh, what kinds of, of, of tensions that both reflected and injected into Turkish society, and what challenges, therefore, uh, for rethinking uh, religious values and ideals, and trying to manage this dynamic of continuity and change. That's how I'm defining this dynamic of Tajikistan. It's always been a way of trying to say, how do we remain faithful to our values but adapt to current to current circumstances? One last question. The speaker is available uh, during the lunch and later in the, uh, during the reception time. So please uh, feel free to ask more questions. Thank you.